Hey, welcome to the Christ Revealed YouTube channel. I got a great interview coming up for you. Really great to be here with you. Enjoy this interview. I love the characterization, the good news, because mm -hmm. that, that's how it's referred to. Here's the good news. Mm -hmm. So why do you think they, he referred to it as the good news? I mean, it could be referred to a, a lot of ways, but here's the good news. Yes, well, you know, in the book of Isaiah, there's a special blessing. Mm -hmm. It says, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the person who brings good news, mm -hmm. who proclaims glad tidings of joy, who says to Jerusalem, your king comes. Good news, what we now call the gospel from the Greek word euangelion, when we say evangelistic or evangelism or the evangel, mm -hmm. it all comes back to that prophecy in Isaiah that the one who brings the good news brings glad tidings of hope. And there was this expectation that this would be the job of the servant of the Lord, and that's the job which, that Jesus was doing, bringing that good news. So uh, what other uh, parts of the New Testament do you personally find maybe the most inspiring you know, when, when you teach them, like that you love to bring into the classroom and say, I can't wait to teach this part today. Okay, well, I, first of all, I have to say I love teaching all my classes uh -huh. because I get to do New Testament and it's the most wonderful and exciting material, right. number one but I am a huge fan of Paul. Yeah. Paul is really so misunderstood and people resent him and they think he's so repressive and terrible. Mm -hmm. And it is because they do not understand the context of the world in which he lived and how he envisioned this good news for Gentiles. Right. So people think he's terrible, but I think we just need to get a fresh look at Paul. I love teaching Paul in context. So can you give us a fresh look at Paul then? Well, there are all these discussions about law mm -hmm. and whether the Gentiles have to follow the law or not. And, and the final outcome was that, no, Gentiles do not have to convert to Judaism. That's what follow the law means. It means to convert to Judaism and be circumcised mm -hmm. in order to be a follower of Jesus, who is the Jewish Messiah. This was a passionate debate in the early church mm -hmm. because it seemed like logically consistent that if Jesus were the Jewish Messiah and the Gentiles want to believe in him, they should have to convert. Right. But Paul, Paul's position won out and Peter allied with that, etc. So then he has to face these issues that need to be worked out, which are thorny issues, issues of meat offered to idols, mm -hmm. issues of how to have table fellowship in congregations that are both Jewish and Gentile. Mm -hmm. And we see that, you know, despite his very emotional outbursts at time in his letters, sometimes he's, you know, quite excited and very blunt and hard hitting, um, he develops maturely as a pastor. Mm -hmm. So that by the time we get to the book of Romans, mm -hmm. and he's writing to the church at Rome, which is truly a Gentile Jewish combo mm -hmm. with leadership who are Jewish Christians and Gentile followers primarily. He deals with how to have a potluck dinner. <laughs> I love this. And he says, well, you know, there are some people who think that you can eat all foods, that all food is clean. And he calls them the strong. Mm -hmm. And he says, and there are other people who think that you can only eat vegetables. And he calls them the weak. Now, this is just code language. Right. Obviously, the people who are only eating vegetables are the Jewish Christians who feel that you can only eat kosher, right. and they don't want to eat food offered to idols, or they don't want to eat meat that hasn't been ritually slaughtered, so they're going to just play it safe. Right. Whereas the strong are the Christian Gentiles who feel, well, you know, it doesn't matter, I can eat anything. Right. He says, now, when we come together to have food, <laughs> you strong ones because strong, of course, is a positive thing. Everybody wants to be strong. Right. So he's gonna ask them to do the difficult thing. You strong ones need to take consideration for your weaker brothers. Right. He says, you have freedom. Freedom means that you have two choices. Mm -hmm. Freedom means you can partake, but freedom also means that you can abstain. Mm -hmm. Whichever you choose is an expression of your freedom. Mm. Whereas your poor weaker brother, who can only eat the vegetables, he only has one choice. Mm. He can only abstain because of his conscience, because it creates a crisis of conscience. Mm -hmm. He says, so, do the big thing, being magnanimous. When you come together, you abstain for the sake of your brother, because Christ laid down his life for that man mm. or that woman. And if Jesus was willing to die for them, why should you make life hard over the food? kingdom of God is not about what you eat or what you drink, 
but it's about righteousness and peace and joy. Now this to me is pastoral wisdom. It's very clever. Mm -hmm. He's very, you know, he's very analytical and he's really getting people to do what he wants. Right. Or we have the letter to Philemon. Uh -huh. Why is the letter to Philemon, this one page letter about a runaway slave, mm -hmm. why is that in the New Testament? Well, he addresses this letter to Philemon and Aphia and Archippus mm -hmm. and the church in their house. So these are three church letters. Mm -hmm. And in this letter, after he's addressed it to all of them and the church in their house, then he writes and he talks only to Philemon. And it's a I, Paul, and you, second person singular Philemon. Mm -hmm. I want you, Philemon, to forgive the runaway slave Onesiphorus. He did a bad thing, but he's come to know the Lord, and I've been mentoring him, and he's sorry, and I know that he owes you money, but of course, you're not going to ask him for that money because you owe your debt of life to me because I'm the apostle of Jesus, and I'm Jesus' prisoner in right. prison as he writes this. So forgive the debt, but accept the guy back and take him and, and nurture him and let him be part of your congregation. Now this whole letter, if you took away the dear three people and the church and love Paul at the end, it's all a personal conversation. Yeah. But Paul addresses that letter to Philemon and Aphia and Archippus and the church in their house so that the letter will be read out loud in the congregational setting with all of the people there. And then what is Philemon going to do? Philemon has only one choice. Everybody has heard Paul ask him to forgive Onesimus, and so he's going to have to do it. And why is that letter in the New Testament? There is one suggestion about how the canon of Paul's letters came together was that Bishop Onesimus mm -hmm. of Ephesus was that same slave who later became one of the church leaders in Ephesus and who kept copies and compiled the letters and added to it his own letter of liberation and forgiveness. It's, wow. just, it's just wonderful stuff. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really a fascinating study. Mm -hmm. So uh, when people come, because you have people coming from foreign countries yeah. to come study at your school here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and from different cultures, uh, what's the average amount of time they would, they would spend here to study uh, yes. in your postgraduate courses? Yes, our school is international and interdenominational. Mm -hmm. So Christians from all backgrounds are studying with us. A Master of Arts program is designed to take two years, mm -hmm. but that usually is dependent on the student already having their biblical language prerequisites, so biblical Hebrew and biblical Greek, right. under their belt. If they haven't already fulfilled their language requirements, then it could take three or four years mm -hmm. to do a master's because you have to have, those are like the tools in your toolbox of biblical studies. Right. You need your languages. Master of Divinity is offered in Korean only, and it takes three years minimally to do a Master of Divinity. Um, sometimes it will take five, probably, if you don't have your languages. Interesting and then, that's offered yeah. in Korean. Why Korean? Our degree programs grew as the need and demand emerged. So. The Master of Arts was our first degree program. It's, it's preparatory for usually doing PhD studies, but mm -hmm. some people will do an MA without going on to a PhD. Mm -hmm. uh, as our Korean student body grew, there was an expressed need or desire for a Master of Divinity where they could do their coursework her, here. Yeah. So we said, well, you know, we're not a church-sponsored school. We're interdenominational and we don't ordain anybody. So doing an MDiv is like a hard thing because what would you do? Right. But there, there's an organization in Korea called KaiCam. It's a parachurch organization that our school became a member of, mm -hmm. the Korean Association of Independent Churches and Ministries. And our MDiv graduates go back to Korea so that they can be evaluated and tested and, and within this Korean organization receive ordination. So it's, it's just totally a Korean thing because they desire this particular path into uh, parachurch ministry. That's it for this particular interview. Thanks for joining me. Really excited to take this ongoing journey with you as we keep bringing more content. If you haven't already, you really should subscribe to this channel. There's a lot of phenomenal content coming down the road into the future that you'll want to know about. Leave a comment down here. I think people would love to hear from you and then you can hear from them too. If you liked it, go ahead and give a like. It only takes half a second and share this with people that you care about. The world needs more light in it right now. So thanks for being with me. Hope to connect with you again soon. Thank you.